Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're going to get started at 6.03. We're just going to allow our participants to come in. Uh, welcome. We are so happy to have you joining us for our Q4 public meeting for the Bellwether District. And again, we will get started at 6.03 to allow more participants to come in, but welcome. Okay, let's get started in the interest of time. I think a good amount of registrants are here. So hello everyone and welcome to our Q4 community meeting for the Bellwether District. Tonight, you're gonna to hear some really great updates from our environmental development and corporate affairs team. Before we get started, as always, I wanna share some housekeeping rules. Um, we are gonna do Q&A a little bit different tonight. So please, 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 if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function in the chat as we always do. However, there's a twist. If you would like to ask your question live, please raise your hand virtually and my colleague Corey will give you the ability to show your camera and unmute your line. I do wanna ask that we limit live questions to one per person and to 30 seconds per question. We truly wanna give everyone equal time and get through all the questions. Uh, we will get through as many questions as we can with the time that we've allowed it. And as always, if we don't get to your question immediately, uh, we will, respond in writing and post on the website. So if we don't get to your question, please try to use the Q&A function so that we can record them and ensure that we're answering them. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that we're asking you to please be respectful of one another. And we're looking forward to a really productive meeting. Next slide. So one reminder, um, you will hear from the environmental development and the corporate affairs team to start our agenda. I'm gonna turn our, the program over to Justin Dunn, our fearless SVP of industrial development. Justin, you're up. Thank you, Jazz. Appreciate the, the introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm Justin Dunn, uh, Senior Vice President uh, for the Industrial Development here at uh, the Bellwether District. So tonight we have uh, a few guests with us along with our teammates. Uh, I'll run down the list uh, quickly. Kirk Carter, Vice President of Development, also on the industrial team. Blake Rowan uh, from our development team. On the life sciences, we have Melissa Schrock, Executive Vice President of Mixed Use. Uh, George Needs, Senior Vice President. And Amanda Ma Maisie, sorry, Amanda, uh, Director for Mixed Use. We also, of course, have Jazz and Mia, who you've, you probably know well. We also have presenting uh, Robin Fitzgerald Green from CBT. Uh, he'll show uh, a good bit of the master planning 
efforts that have gone in or the conceptual plan that we're willing to show. Uh, dynamic for the traffic engineering uh, with Corey Chase and uh, Jake Medendorp from Pannoni as well, our civil engineer. Next slide. So here is uh, really, it's an aerial of our site. Uh, most folks on this, on, this, um, on this call know where the site is obviously, uh, but here what we're looking at is everything north of Pass Young shown in that kind of reddish color is really dedicated to the life science um, planning effort. It's about 250 total acres. You'll hear more from George Needs uh, in detail from that area. Again, strategically located um, close to University City and Penovations. We feel that that ecosystem uh, makes sense to carry on up at the north. And then south of Passyunk, uh, all the way down through Penrose is the industrial logistics area. So that's again, e-commerce logistics uh, park. That's about 750 acres. Next slide. So again, giving more context to the industrial that my team's focused on here, uh, 750 total acres. That's gonna yield about 10.5 million square feet of class A industrial uh, buildings. Uh, that really equates to about 10,500 permanent jobs at the end of the 10 year um, approximate timeline that we have for this development. And really, as a whole, between the industrial and life sciences, we're looking at generally about 100 million annually for city tax revenue and about 120 for the Pennsylvania region, uh, which is a great influx of revenue for, for both parties. I'm going to turn it over to George Needs to talk about the life science. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is George Needs. I'm with our mixed use development team here at HRP, and I'm responsible for overseeing the, uh, the life sciences component of the project here. So um, as, as, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the life sciences sector um, has grown substantially over the last few years, and the city of, of Philadelphia has emerged as an important market uh, within that ecosystem, uh, largely driven by its presence of, of world-class research institutions and uh, the available workforce. So we believe we have a, a great opportunity here to create a first-class life science hub that will attract uh, the types of institutions, companies, and research professionals that will really help uh, the city's life sci sciences sector uh, to grow and uh, to create jobs along the way. So uh, sort of in keeping with that, we've identified an area of approximately 250 acres uh, across two distinct parcels. You can see uh, on the plan here shown in red, that's parcel A and parcel B. And those are located on the northern portion of the site, everything that's really north of, of Pashyunk Avenue. And, uh, you know, based on the size and, uh, you know, looking at, at a conceptual fr framework that we've laid out, we believe we could deliver you know, three to four million square feet uh, over the course of a multi-year, multi-phase build-out, uh, which uh, you know, could deliver about eight and a half thousand direct jobs uh, at full build-out. And uh, you know, these jobs would cover the full spectrum of qualifications ranging from you know, entry level and high school diplomas all the way through uh, post, you know, to postgraduate uh, doctorates. Um, so we're going to go through it in, in a little bit more detail uh, later on in the presentation. But, you know, as I mentioned, this is a multi-phase build out. It's going to take many years to deliver. It. And as a result, we're really primarily focused on parcel A at this point, um, given the existing access and its proximity to some of the other key research institutions around uh, in and around uh, University City. Um, and obviously, if successful, we'll then have uh, uh, the opportunity and we'll look into uh, being able to expand uh, into parcel B. But we have put together a conceptual framework um, you know, for that. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin uh, from CBT Architects who can walk you through uh, that framework. 
Yeah, thanks, George. So I'm um, introduced myself. Good evening, everyone. Robin Fitzgerald Green with CPT Architects. We're based in Boston doing urban design and, and planning and architecture, both obviously in Boston, but uh, Philadelphia and around the country and, and in other places within the world. So really excited to work on this. And I think what's, you know, what has been highlighted is there's there's great um, access to the site in terms of its proximity to things, but there's not actually great physical access. And I think that's one of the big challenges and opportunities we have here is sort of this Google Expressway and its and the other uh, abutting uses. You know, how do we how do we reintegrate something that's been uh, for 150 years sort of separate from the city and apart? And how do we bring that back together? So we'll, we'll walk you through some of the ways we're going to do that um, and some of the details on that. And then we'll turn it back over to talk about some of the early phase developments with, with both George and Justin. So next slide, please. So I think, you know, of course, when thinking about a site this big, there's obviously been lots of good thinking and planning that's been going on in the, you know, in all of Philadelphia, as well as more, more locally in the lower school master plan and other pieces, you know, across the river at Bartram's Garden. Uh, and, and, you know, we learning from that and how do we start there as to, you know, what we can do on a piece of, uh, you know, a large piece of property and land that, that is ready to be transformed from its previous use. And so I think next slide. Uh, shows a couple of those plans and how they actually did discuss and, and think about ways to connect, uh, particularly the north side of the site, into the neighborhoods, into Grace Ferry, into Forgotten Bottom, across to Bartram's Garden. All those things are important, uh, you know, important pieces that we need to think about when we, you know, given the opportunity to develop something that was not really part of the city at all. And so, in doing that, if you go to the next slide, we've tried to establish three, you know, three main project goals. Obviously, goal number one is to reintegrate the site. Uh, how do we get this back to be part of Philadelphia and part of South Philly and Southwest Philadelphia? And I think also, you know, in doing that, how do we do that in, in a way that brings green into a site that didn't have any before? So it's obviously its former use is not the cleanest. Uh, and we'll talk about that later in the evening. But I think the, you know, the, what we can do now can bring uh, green connections in the site, as well as enhance the transit connections, because there really was no reason to bring transit here, and now we have one. And so we really want to make sure that we're setting this project up in a way that will uh, make it seem much more seamless than it ever ever might expect it to be. So if we go to the next slide, we'll go into some of the details of how we're going to do that. So, you know, first piece of that is obviously to create new public streets. And, you know, public is an important piece of this. These are not private streets. We want these to be part of Philadelphia. And I think, you know, making sure that we're making you know, connections to existing network where we can, uh, given the given the barriers of the highway and, and some of the other elements. But I think getting into passing you know, getting onto Penrose, getting on 26th Street, connecting to 34th Street and Fair Avenue, Main Lane, you know, all the way down 20, 28th Street down to Passyunk are all going to be big pieces of this. And we'll get into more detail about how we do that. But if you go to the next slide. You know, I think one thing that's important to us too is when designing these streets and thinking about them that we, you know, we're starting from that uh, complete streets guideline the city has developed. And when we say complete streets, that's an, you know, a guideline to help us understand how not just to provide space for cars, but bikes and pedestrians, stormwater, street trees, everything you might expect uh, to support a more robust and sort of, uh, you know, um, open street that can be used by everyone in, in a safe and, and um, you know, it's in a safe manner effectively. So if you go to the next slide. So, you know, one thing to think about is, of course, is what the existing bike network is. And clearly it didn't touch the site and didn't have any reason to. But what we've tried to do, and if you go to the next slide, is say, thinking both about what's been planned along the river, along the opposite side, as well as within our site, how can we connect into the existing network along Passyunk and further north along 34th and Warfield uh, and all the way down to Passyunk? How can we do that to bring bikes and pedestrians within to the site? Uh, and I think if you go to the next slide, We'll also think about that, you know, from an open space perspective too. We obviously I mentioned Bartram's Garden. It's a beautiful and, and wonderful place with amenity within the city. Uh, it's obviously FDR Park is, you know, for it's it's evolved over the years and is also a great piece of the city. And Smith's Playground, those other pieces that are very close to us, but nothing within the site and nothing really connecting to those things or trying to tie them together. So the goal of the project, of course, is to do that in a way that makes sense uh, and do it over time. So if you go to the next slide. You know, we're, we're thinking about how to sort of conceptually, conceptually connect those things together and do that in a way, you know, uh, building on the road network and the and the stormwater network and all the other pieces that will be in, in the street trees and everything else that we're bringing to the site. So we go to the next slide. You know, I think the last piece of this, as we said, the last major goal is to is to integrate the site into the existing transit network, which is is robust. There's lots of buses in the area, but none of them come onto or even you know really abut the site in any in any meaningful way today. 
So the project team and, and has been thinking about this and also working with SEPTA to try to figure out how we can build upon and create roads that can allow for uh, bus and other infrastructure to, to, to integrate into the site so that we can really get people here on more ways than just cars. So I think uh, if you go to the next slide, you know, what we're showing here is really a long-term vision. And I want to you know, emphasize long-term because I think the point and, and something that CBT does all the time, and I know we've tried hard to do with HRP here, is to develop a framework that can evolve with the project. This is, you know, the thousand acres that are under consideration here are, are going to take time to build out, you know, may take 10 years on the industrial side, it may, may take more time on the life sciences side. And so we have to set up a framework that can evolve over time and, and really go into great detail in those places that are the most immediate. And that's what we'll talk about in the next couple of pieces. But what we're trying to set up here is a flexible framework that can uh, involve to meet the needs of the city, meet the needs of the economy, meet the needs of the but, you know, budding neighborhoods and everyone else. So I think if I'm gonna turn it back over to Justin to talk about that first phase of the industrial side of the development. Thank you, Robin. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, there we go. So one of the greatest challenges we face is, is really just getting started, right? Just kicking something of this magnitude off, off, of, uh, off the ground. And how we do that uh, apart from the framework is to really focus in on the phasing and this first step in the development process. And so I'll touch on the industrial side, which is what is highlighted here, um, that Southern building is what we're calling lot 15. It's a 326,000 square foot building. And the Northern building on this page is a 700,000 square foot, um, you know, spec building that were proposed. So we have earthwork uh, commencing uh, this winter. Uh, so it's likely to start somewhere in that January timeframe. Uh, we have vertical, vertical construction starting in spring of 2023 and we have that completing in spring of 2024. Next slide. So again this shows kind of a zoomed in version um, and really what we're looking at building on the industrial side are class A warehouse. When I say class A warehouses you're kind of seeing a glimpse to the left of the of the page is the storefront of this of these buildings so these are these are not the typical you know industrial style kind of dirty buildings these are very much clean space um you think about the the, the um you know the large tenants that would occupy these um, big retail names big um you know e-commerce logistics you know we would love to have some what we call light manufacturing. It's not smokestack manufacturing, but light manufacturing back here. Um, and so again, just kind of creating a, a campus that has that class A feeling and is a much more, um, you know, I guess, uh, robust uh, park. Next slide. So on the vehicular uh, circulation, what's shown here in orange um, is really phase one of our infrastructure. So these are the roadways that we're proposing uh, for this first phase. As Robin pointed out, we've got you know, a whole plan of public roads. We need that flexibility. So we do that methodically. We build the first phase and it allows us to, uh, you know, build in flexibility, do this in a way that's cost effective, do this in a way that allows us to continue to gauge the market and build product type that makes sense for the most efficient uh, use of the space and including jobs. Next uh, slide. And then along with that, as Raman had showed earlier, was kind of a detailed uh, plan of kind of the road network along with the street trees and pedestrian access. So we are looking at separating bike paths off of the roads uh, to allow safe passage of, of pedestrian and, and bike access through the, the areas that were highlighted uh, during the, the framework plan. Next slide. And then with the roadway infrastructure comes offsite improvements. We obviously wanna create safe access. Uh, we're very um, conscious of the traffic in the area today. 
Are we gonna solve all of the traffic problems? No, uh, but we can do what we can to alleviate uh, where we can. Opening up this site again for public um, access and throw away, I think is a big step in that. And also making improvements as shown here uh, with this first hard tramp intersection at 26. So what we're looking at on that diagram is, is really not a full light, uh, full signaled intersection. It's actually a um, kind of a three way, if you will. We are keeping the right in right out on Hart Tramp Street that's headed south there on, uh, along Packer Park. Uh, but we do wanna open up a left turn in um, from 26th Street into the park. We're also going to be creating an XL decel lane on each side of 26th Street to allow safe entrance into the Bellwether District and out of the Bellwether District. We're also planning on extending the lanes all the way through down to uh, Penrose. So I'm guilty of having to drive down and sit in the right lane while everyone is passing me on the left and cutting in. I think that if we open up those two lanes, um, and create two right turns that will alleviate a lot of the traffic uh, that builds up there and doing that upstream as well to a point where we can. And again, uh, keeping safe sight distance from where you kind of dip down uh, from the bridge there. Uh, next slide. Oh, I turn it over to George. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, so as, as Justin walked you through, um, you know, the plans for phase one on the industrial side, I'm gonna walk you through uh, what we're planning uh, for phase one on, on the life sciences side. So this, this uh, slide really highlights uh, the boundary, as you can see, for, for phase one, uh, as well as sort of three access points to the site. Um, you know, in this phase, we're planning for three uh, GMP buildings, uh, ranging from 150 to 180,000 square feet. So uh, for those that are, are not familiar with a GMP building, um, these are, these are really uh, buildings that are designed specifically uh, to accommodate the storing and, and manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and therapeutics. So uh, they do tend to be um, sort of what single or two-story buildings with a slightly larger footprint uh, than a traditional R&D or office building. Um, so in total, these three buildings will, will be approximately 500,000 square feet. So that's collectively these three buildings together. Um, uh, will be a total of 500,000 square feet. We've located them at the eastern edge of Parcel A, uh, and we did this given the, the existing access um, that is available to that area of the site today. Um, on the timing, um, we are planning um, for, uh, you know, starting some mass grading in Q2 of, of 2000, or second quarter of 2023. Um, so we're slightly behind, um, you know, what's happening on the industrial side uh, with, the, with the view to uh, commence vertical construction on the first one or two buildings in the first quarter of 2024 um, to then, uh, you know, complete that first phase, uh, first one or two buildings uh, in the first quarter of 2025. Um, and uh, just to highlight some of those entry points, you can see labeled there. So entry point one, uh, that is an existing on and off ramp that services the eastbound lane of, of I-76, and that exists today. Um, we have entry point two, uh, which is, is, is intended to be an extension of 34th Street. Again, you know, 34th Street is, is an existing street today, which we're looking to uh, extend into our site. Uh, and then we have entry point three, uh, which is from, uh, you know, essentially an access point up from Pashyank Avenue, uh, up 28th Street and into Vare, Vare Avenue. Uh, today, a portion of that, you know, primarily on Vare Avenue is a one-way street traveling southbound. Um, so that one way, uh, you know, travels south down Vare Avenue. And uh, we intend to convert that into a two-way two street and that will enable cars uh, to, and vehicles to access the site and travel north um, you know, up Fair Avenue. So access the site from uh, essentially from Pashyank Avenue. Um, just, just jumping to the, the next slide. Um, the next slide 
uh, highlights uh, phase one in a little bit more detail. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, three buildings. We have two buildings, uh, building A and building C, you'll see um, will total approximately 150,000 square feet. And then we have building B, uh, which is, uh, you know, approximately 180,000 square feet. And the images on, on the left, um, you know, give you a sense of what these types of buildings will, will look like. So these are, are typically 30 to 40 feet in height uh, with a mechanical penthouse. Uh, they are intended to be, you know, architecturally attractive buildings that will, uh, you know, support and attract these, uh, these pioneering life sciences companies. Um, so the idea is they would, you know, have, um, you know, nice, you know, glass lobby entrances, um, you know, with uh, the more sort of active program elements facing the street and some of the back of house elements like like loading and servicing, um, you know, generally hidden from from those, uh, you know, public facing streets. Um, additionally, uh, I'd say the, the land walks will be landscaped, I think, as, as Robert mentioned, to a, a complete um, street standard, and and that will be intended to you know create a very welcoming and enjoyable uh, pedestrian experience. This uh, this next slide um, really highlights the key interior road connections that we we'll, we intend to deliver as part of phase one. Um, so uh, you know those primary connections are really illustrated on this plan by those large arrows. Um, those are. Jackson Street, uh, which provides an east-west access off Vare Avenue, and then Fulton Way, uh, which serves as a, a north-south access point off Maiden Lane. Um, both are intended to be dedicated as public streets. Uh, they will be designed, uh, you know, as I mentioned, to complete uh, or meet complete street standards. And as Robin mentioned earlier, these are, you know, a set of design standards that enable sort of the safe use of, of these streets for all users. Um, you know, be it pedestrians, cyclists, you know, vehicles, uh, and uh, they will provide uh, for protected bike lanes, uh, landscape buffers, and and pedestrian sidewalks. So, um, so we're also planning for some secondary service access roads. You can you can see on the plan; those are illustrated by the the thinner arrows, and these are really intended, um, you know, to keep service vehicles off off the interior uh, street network. So the next slide, um, this really illustrates uh, some of the bike and uh, you know pedestrian connections along those primary access roads, and you can see um, you know the the intent there is to provide you know protected bike lanes uh, and you know landscape sidewalks um, you know down Fortin Way, um, uh, Jackson Street, and then uh, along uh, Vare Avenue as well. And lastly, um, in addition to uh, the interior connections, we're also planning on completing some off-site improvements, which um, you'll see on this next slide. Um, so, you know, the idea here, you know, with these improvements is that they will help improve uh, the access to and from the site and will enable us to create those sort of key pedestrian and bicycle connections into the existing road network. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, Vare Avenue, uh, which exists today as a one-way street, moving southbound will be converted into a two-way street that will allow access northbound up from Pashyank Avenue. Uh, now, in order to do that, uh, we'll need to modify Vare Avenue uh, to create a T-intersection, as you can see, um, you know, highlighted or labeled on the plan as the stop sign control. Uh, and that will, uh, you know, essentially serve as a, uh, you know, as a, as a kind of a traffic calming, um, a T intersection that will uh, ensure cars make a complete stop, uh, you know, coming off that highway, um, you know, prior to, to making a turn onto either Verab or, or Maiden Lane. Um, and then uh, I'd say, you know, all of these improvements really give us the opportunity to widen both Vare Avenue and Maiden Lane, and that will allow us to, um, you know, accommodate those protected uh, bike lanes and pedestrian sidewalks and um, we're also uh, planning to restripe 34th Street and, and Warfield Street. Um, so maintaining the, the existing curb line, but um, you know, looking to restripe it, which would uh, enable us to, to incorporate uh, a bike lane that will uh, provide a continuous bike connection all the way from Wharton Street uh, down to, to Pashyank Avenue. 
<clears throat> so just uh, on the next slide, I uh, wanted to touch uh, quickly on the, um, on the schedule. Um, you know, I think as, as part of our ongoing uh, community engagement, you know, we'll, we will continue to hold quarterly CAP and, and quarterly public meetings and, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, intend to do so uh, throughout the, the life of, of this project. Um, I would say, you know, just looking at the time frame, uh, re reiterating it on, on the industrial side, the idea is, um, you know, looking to start masquerading um, in the first quarter of, of next year. So first quarter of 2023, with the goal to start, uh, you know, vertical construction. So start construction on that first building uh, in, in the second quarter of 2023, which would put us at a, at a completion of that first building two buildings in uh, in the second quarter of 2024 and on the life sciences side um you know we are uh, you know lagging the industrial uh, slightly um so the goal there is to uh, you know commence mas masquerading mass earthwork um in the second quarter of 2023 so that is on primarily on parcel a um with the goal to uh, commence vertical construction on the first uh, one or two buildings in the first quarter of 2024 which would put us at a um, you know completion uh, in the first quarter of 2025 so i think with that i'll hand it over to uh, i think mir or or uh, or jasmine thank you development team um if there are any questions, please raise your hand related to what we just listened to. David Steinberg, I saw your hand raised since the beginning, so I'm happy to take your question. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna to move to the next question. I don't see David, maybe he um, changed his mind. Oh, Mr. Reeves, how are you feeling? Oh, hold on, I do see David, one moment. Yes, David, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, uh, I've got a lot of questions. I know I'm only supposed to ask one, so I'll ask So them. we're just gonna ask you to uh, do one in 30 Understood. seconds. Thank you. Okay, um, in my study of the uh, land, uh, several years ago, it came to my attention that when rising waters comes, as it's, as it's all coming, probably a lot quicker than people think, that uh, it appeared as though 30 to 40 percent of the refinery land would be underwater. My question is, what is going to be done to mitigate that? I'll take that one, Jazz. That's a great question, David. Uh, we have our engineering firms. Um, working through the floodplain study that is in for a Clomar. And we are almost final with that study to allow us to really raise the site, create some resiliency and get the parking lots out of the hundred year floodplain, which by default on vertical allows the finished floors to be out of the 500 year floodplain. So most of the floodplain uh, that you're referring to is really at that Southwestern portion along the river and it creeps up in towards the middle of the site. So you're, you're pretty accurate with about 30 to 40% of that site being in the floodplain down at the south. So, but great question. We are working to raise the site out and create that, uh, you know, create, eliminate uh, our site from being in the floodplain. I would love to ask another question, but I know I can't. Well, David, I'll, hopefully I'll you'll get one more opportunity. Or and uh, you can, remember, you can always use the chat. Uh, true. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David, for your question. Mr. Reeves, I saw your hand go up next. How are you? Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay, how you doing? How you doing, Mr. Reeves? Hey, question, Mr. Reeves, I'm great. My question is on the life science part down here, and I guess it's to the architect. And my main concern is the community engagement with these designs, Fair Street, Warfield Street, SEPTA, in and out. Is there a community engagement component or do you look forward to making one? You understand my question? 
you're asking about community engagement for the yeah. designs? You know, with the, the architect, like when you say, well, he said he's going to span Wilford Street, he's going to span Fair Avenue, he's going to add scepter uh, routes, right? And all that is going to change what already exists, right? So I'm concerned about what the community input was. Yeah, yeah, Jazz, maybe, maybe I, I can take this, but, you know, I'd say, you know, as we highlighted on the... Um, you know, on the schedule, the, the intent is to, you know, have, have quarterly meetings. I think, you know, some, some, um, some of those meetings will, um, you know, on the agenda will include, you know, updates, um, you know, to development activities. So, um, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, over the course of the next, uh, you know, few months working with the city, uh, work, working with the various different departments to, um, you know, finalize these plans and make sure sort of what we're delivering um, you know, meets the uh, the standards, regulations, and um, you know, making sure that um, you know we're, we're de delivering a project that's sort of fitting um, you know within within the city and within those parameters. So, um, you know, I would say uh, on the community engagement front, um, you know, we're going to maintain those uh, quarterly meetings. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr. Reeves. How about um, author Morton, you were next. Um, please ask your question. Hello. Hi, we're waiting for your question. Hi, how are you? Fantastic, uh, thanks. Good. Uh, Arthur Morton, I, first of all, I want to say it's a uh, an exciting project. Uh, a lot of planning has going into the development, as, as, as anyone can see. My concern is, or an interest, I should say, not so much a concern, is for an opportunity to, to meet with uh, the members of the company and and find that there if there's some uh, opportunity for uh, participation in some way uh, as a, as a group uh, or representing or potentially would represent a group of uh, African American developers, et cetera. So Mr. Morton, I'll make sure that you have my contact information. That right. is really important to us. Um, our economic opportunity plan is in the forefront of how we develop um, from our street names down to how we hire. So I'll make sure that I put my um, information in the chat so that you have it. Okay, those are those are kind of per periphery kinds of things. I, you know, I really okay. want to get to more of the meat of it, the economics of it all. And, and I completely uh, understand. And, yep. But anyway, Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to that. And it's it's a great plan. I'd like to figure out how to find a fit in the overall project. Absolutely. I'll ensure that you have my contact information so we can discuss further and connect you with the right person. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Uh, David would be next. And I'm not going to attempt your it because I don't want to butcher your name, sir. Hello. I just wanted to say that, like, I feel like this engagement process is a sham. Like, we all met several months ago. We we shared questions. I even sent you emails. No, I'm not sharing my video. Um, you know, I sent you emails asking where the results of those questions were. You didn't respond to those emails. So um, I just feel like you all need to start ho holding these meetings in person where we can actually collaborate and discuss things together. And this whole process that you, you think is engagement with the community just doesn't cut it. So thank you. Thank you for your comment, David. Richard Burrell. Hello. Hi, how are you? 
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Just okay, waiting for okay. your question, oh, Mr. Brown. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I, um, uh, my question is, I, I, you may have covered this. I, I apologize if you did. I, I came in a little late. I'm, uh, I, I actually live nearby here in, in uh, what would be Lidlow's Grace Ferry on this map here. Um, but uh, my question, I guess, is, is related to the, the trail network that we have along Scuba River, uh, you know, the Scuba River Trail and how that connects, how, how we can make that connection between what we already have that connects to Barchin's Garden and Forgotten Bottom um, and then down to FDR Park and then how, how those connections are made. I think, um, you know, I think that's, that's something that I would be most interested in. And hearing about and I again I apologize I you may have covered this but I came in a, a little late yeah Amanda do you want to would you could you jump to the um to the sort of overall plan you know I think um you know, as we think about sort of a long term, you know, a long term goal, um, you know, is is um, you know to deliver um, you know open space connections, um, you know, through the site, um, and um, you know, I'd say you know, obviously, you know, given the challenge um, of the site's prior use, that there, there are sort of existing restrictions that that exist on the site that prevent us from from doing that today. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, it's not atypical for, for a site, you know, of this profile uh, to, to have to work through that. So, um, you know, there, there may be an opportunity um, to, um, you know, at some point to, to amend those uh, restrictions. However, um, you know, it, it can be a, a multi-year process. Um, but what it, what it doesn't do, it doesn't, it doesn't prevent us from um, sort of making these active, um, safe, sort of landscaped, uh, pedestrian and bicycle connections you know through the site um, that we that we highlighted on the plan so I think you know the good story is 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 you know we're creating those nice um, kind of landscaped connections that will give um, an opportunity for um, you know bicycle connections pedestrian connections uh, to be made you know north south through the site which um, you know obviously obviously didn't exist today so um, you know, it's something. It's something we've. Um, you know, we've got to we've got to work through. Um, but I think, um, you know, having those opportunities, I think, um, you know, and, and making them really sort of nice landscaped pedestrian experiences, I think, is going to be a big, um, you know, important important com component uh, of this project. Thanks, George. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. And I see another question from Robert Holbrook. Robert, would you like to ask a question? I would, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. So for starters, I want to say what it is that you're doing in an area that my wife and her family grew up in is fantastic. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful project. One of the things that I was curious about, so from a professional standpoint, uh, there's an interest here, but also from a personal standpoint, I have lots of friends and family over by the Penrose Avenue. So if you're familiar with Packer Park, Sienna Place, um, all of that area there, that Penrose Strip is very much like a highway. And I heard you gloss over it or mention it, and I know that's later down the road, uh, but I was curious to know, do you have plans for creating an environment where bicycles and pedestrians who are walking can have a safe area as well as, if you're familiar with that traffic by that diner, it, it's very much a speed zone that's a little unsafe to cross. So I'm curious if you have plans for that or if you've thought of that. I'll take this one, Jazz. I think it, I'm I'm struggling to understand where the diner is. Where the Penrose Avenue is actually where the Wawa and the Chick Fil A or the 
future Chick-fil-A is being built right now. Um, and right by the ocean pass. So see the blue line as the blue line goes over the green line? Oh, down, down there at Packer Park. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't have a, a good answer in terms of what, what um, you know, from a pedestrian access point, um, if you're trying to make, you know, from, from a traffic perspective or connection, you know, that's, that's definitely not something that is currently on the, in the, in the uh, development plan at this moment. I just, I, I heard you mention the way in which you want to commute, connect a lot of different roads. I would put that out there as an opportunity to think about. Right. And I, I would also defer to, to Corey from Dynamic on the traffic impact study that we've done, if we've examined any of that, that portion from a, re, you know, from a regional traffic standpoint. We did, Mr. Holbrook, we did prepare a detailed traffic study that's currently being diligently reviewed by the city and the state. And that intersection was included in our overall study area. So we are looking at the impacts there and obviously looking at ways to perform any sort of mitigation that the city and state recommend. Understood, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are gonna to move to our next section because we still have a, a very packed agenda and Juliana Connolly. Thanks, Jen. Hi everyone, my name is Juliana Connolly and I lead environmental remediation work here at the Bellwether District and for HRP throughout the country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I always like to start uh, updates on remediation work at this property by just reminding everyone or informing those of you who may not know yet that there are two what we would refer to as responsible parties under environmental regulations at, that are doing work on this property. There's our group, so you may know us as HRP. You will also hear me refer to us as PESRAM. PESRAM is the, the former uh, refinery entity that has responsibility for the contamination in the subsurface that, that we are acting through. So you'll, you'll hear me use both of those terms. The other party, that has responsibility for cleanup of environmental contamination on the property is Evergreen or Sunoco. You'll hear both of those terms used Evergreen and Sunoco have also have responsibility for older contamination that's present on the property. The simplest way to think about it is that contamination, so petroleum or other contaminants that were released or, or leaked into the soil and groundwater at the property, if that contamination occurred prior to September 2012, it, that responsibility for the cleanup is Evergreen and Sunoco's to take care of. And if it occurred after that date, it's PESRAM or HRP's responsibility. And the reason for that date is just that's the date at which this refinery was sold from Sunoco to PESRAM back in 2012. And HRP is now doing the cleanup work that was related to PESRAM's operation. So this, this uh, slide just sort of summarizes those specific activities, but that's the simplest way to think about it before September 12, 2012 and after September 2012. Next slide, please. So for the after 2012 cleanup work, so these are releases or leaking of petroleum that occurred to the subsurface after September 2012, there are five areas that we currently are working on bringing through the Pennsylvania Site Cleanup Program. That program is referred to as Act Two. Some of you may know it as Act Two, or you may not. Um, it's also referred to as a land recycling program, but it's the state's site cleanup program. The first step in cleaning up a release under Act Two is to submit what's called a Notice of Intent to Remediate, or an NIR. And that just indicates that you know the release has occurred, who is the responsible party, that sort of information. So there are five areas across the site where PESRAM um, or HRP is working on cleaning up those areas under Act 2, where we've submitted a notice of intent to remediate. Those five areas are shown on this figure. We do 
We won't be surprised, I guess I would say, if we find additional areas as we continue through demolition and earthwork. And so you may see some more areas come up as we start to get in to the subsurface and we see new conditions. So we, you might see more of those come up as we our work proceeds. Reports associated with these act two activities are available on our website. If you go to the bellwetherdistrict.com and then under the community section, you'll see a report section and then a section called remediation. And that's where these reports are available on our website if anyone's interested in looking at them. Next slide, please. This table is talking about those same five areas that I showed on the prior uh, slide. And this gives a little bit of a summary of the status of the cleanup in each of these areas. The second column you'll see here lists the date of the release. And so you'll see, as I mentioned before, these are all after 2012. Uh, the first one, the number three separator area, that's an area where groundwater and oil has been pumped out of the ground. Currently, we're in a monitoring stage there. I'll focus on the second row here because that's the largest area that, that we have to clean up. This is an approximately eight acre area. And we've transitioned to a new remedial technology versus the remedial technology that was in place uh, under the prior ownership. And that technology is called soil vapor extraction. And it involves really more aggressively trying to remove the petroleum that's in the subsurface uh, from the ground by converting that petroleum first to a vapor phase, so to the, the air phase instead of the liquid phase. And that allows us to move it more easily through the subsurface. Next slide, please. Another activity that we're doing at the site that isn't specifically active remediation, but involves a lot of environmental sampling. And this is the type of sampling that might cause us to identify new contamination. This sampling is really intended to look for, is there new contamination? This relates to closure of the above ground storage tanks that many of you may be familiar with having seen on the property. So these were those big uh, circular tanks that are cylindrical tanks really that you would have seen throughout the property. Many of them have been removed at this point. They're referred to as ASTs or above ground storage tanks. And they would have historically stored petroleum, different types of petroleum. So oil, gasoline, diesel, all, all different types of things. Those tanks are very highly regulated by the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And to decommission and close that, those tanks, there's a lot of sampling of the soil. So collection of, the, of soil samples and sending those samples to a laboratory for chemical analysis. That sampling is required to officially close the tanks under the regulatory program. And the intent is again, to make sure that there weren't any releases to the soil and groundwater under the, that occurred under the tanks that you wouldn't have been able to see while the tank was in place. In this case, there were so many tanks at the site that just to organize ourselves a little bit, we grouped the tanks into eight different tank groups. And those are these color coded areas you see across the property. And they're just grouped by sort of tanks that are close together. And we're going, as those tanks are demolished, we do the sampling underneath, and there's a lot of regulatory reporting and reporting back of those analytical data that occurs as that sampling is completed. These reports, as they're, as they're finalized and submitted to the department, are also posted to our website if anyone is interested in looking at them more closely. Again, you can go to the project website, the bellwetherdistrict.com, and then it's gonna be community reports and remediation. And then you'll see um, these reports associated with this sampling work. Next slide, please. Another type of sampling that we're doing at the site relates to a soil management plan that we prepared in, it was finalized in June of 2020. 
And this soil management plan really related, it was really driven by the fact that to accomplish the development that you've been hearing about during this presentation, we need to move a lot of soil at the site. And what I mean by this, and this might relate to David Steinberg, your question earlier, what is currently the case at the site is there are portions of the site at lower elevation and there are portions of the site that are currently at higher elevation. And that leaves certain portions of the site vulnerable to flood hazard, to, so to, to flooding under current conditions, but certainly under future conditions where uh, water levels may be higher. To address that, we are going to raise the elevations of those vulnerable, those flood vulnerable areas. And we'll do that by relocating soil in higher elevation areas that are not vulnerable to flood hazard to, to lower elevation areas. I'm simplifying it uh, drastically, but that's the concept. Move soil from the higher areas to the lower areas to um, remedy essentially that, that flood hazard. And, and this movement of the soil re requires um, a, a very large volume to accomplish the elevations that we're talking about. One thing that we wanted to be sure about and that we wanted members of the community to be informed about and we wanted uh, regulatory agencies like the Department of Environmental Protection to be aware of is that we, we wanted to make sure we had a lot of good information about the chemical sort of composition of the soil, the nature of the contamination in the soil prior to moving the soil, okay? So we sort of have a site that we know has historical contamination, perhaps, you know, unsurprisingly given its use as an oil refinery for over a hundred years. And then we have this need to make sure that the site is, is safe from flood hazard. So before we're moving the soil, and it's documented in this report, I refer to as the soil management plan, we are sampling all of the soil that we plan to move. So we're collecting samples, sending it to a laboratory, similar to the AFT sampling I was talking about before, but there we're focused on sampling underneath tanks. Here we're focused on sampling soil that we plan to move. In some cases, those areas overlap and in some cases they do not. So we've done a lot of that sampling already. And what you can see here in this figure is um, sort of the color coding indicates general categories of, of soil. The green uh, shading indicates relatively cleaner soil, so lower concentrations, and then the orange and blue indicate um, relatively sort of higher concentration soils. It's important for us to know that so that we can manage that soil appropriately during redevelopment and also just for transparency to members of the community. This information is also available on our website, again, under the community tab, reports, and then there's a tab associated with soil management. Um, this, that's where you could find this information if you wanted to see more specifically what it looks like. Next slide, please. The last slide I have here is to talk about benzene outdoor air monitoring. Some of you may have heard about this, some of you may have not, so I'll, I'll do a little background. During the operation of the refinery, it was a requirement, it's a US EPA, so a federal requirement, to monitor benzene concentrations in the outdoor air at the perimeter of the property. And I, I'll just pause for a second. Benzene is an organic chemical that is present in crude oil. So it's it's present in other things as well. So it's it's present in tobacco smoke. It can be present in paint. It can be present in car exhaust. It can be present in other types of industrial exhausts or emissions. But with respect to refineries, it's present in crude oil, which is the material that comes into a refinery to be processed or refined. And therefore, it is also present in the products that are produced or refined at a refinery. So it starts in the crude oil and it sort of makes its way through all those other different products at different, different levels. That's sort of part of the refining process. So the point is it, it's, it's monitored 
at refinery. Lost the slide deck. Did you guys lose the slide deck? Uh, yes, we did. Back up. Well, Juliana, while we wait, do you want to take a question? How's that sound? Sure. Okay, I have one. I'll start at the top and we'll wait for Corey to get the, um, the slides back up. Will any of your sources test water lines? What I'm saying, we, will we know if there are contaminations with our water flow near 61st and Passyunk? Um, I, I'm assuming that question is associated with drinking water. But if I've got it wrong, type it in the Q&A. Um, that, so I want to be really clear, this, it's a great question and it's important to know about the quality of drinking water. The groundwater at this site and the groundwater in the city of Philadelphia is not used as a drinking water source. So the water in the drinking water pipes that, that comes into buildings for use is not the water that's in the, in the ground here. In some places it is, in some places you do use groundwater as a source of drinking water, but in Philadelphia, that is not the case. So when we're sampling the groundwater, we need to sample it to understand the extent of impacts, but it, that does not reflect anything about the quality, the chemical quality of drinking water near the site, because that, that's not the source of the drinking water in Philadelphia. Thanks, JC. I think we have your presentation back, is that correct? Yep, I can see it now. Excellent. So, so benzene is a is a chemical that, as I talked about, is present in crude oil and therefore present in, in the products that are refined at refineries. And so it's required to be monitored at active refineries, sort of just as a an indicator of whether there are emissions from the refinery uh, occurring at the perimeter of a refinery property. It's not measuring like the output of a stack or anything like that. It's just measuring the outdoor air. So again, it could, could be influenced by other things like car emissions, anything like that. This was a requirement while the refinery was operating. It's no longer a requirement because the refinery isn't operating, but it's been interesting information. It's been interesting data to evaluate sort of the impact of shutting down and demolishing the refinery on sort of benzene concentrations in the, in the neighborhood. So we have continued to do it, uh, even though the refinery has not been operating for quite some time now, we've been continuing to monitor those benzene concentrations and we'll continue to do that through the end of this year. What we see when we measure these benzene concentrations, which we do at approximately 30 locations every two weeks, is that the benzene concentrations at the perimeter on average have come down at, as the refinery has sort of come offline and then since been deconstructed. We see the most significant decreases as the demolition and decommissioning has progressed and those residual petroleum products have been removed from the property. So what you can see on the bottom right here, the little bar chart is that the concentrations in 2019 were actually the highest. So I'm showing here the average concentration across that whole year. So in 2018, it was about three and a half. In 2019, it was almost six. In 2020, you see that concentration come down to less than three. In 2021, even lower. This year in 2022, now that much of the decommissioning work had been completed, Completed and the demolition work is proceeding, we're seeing those concentrations come down even lower. So if, for example, the average concentration from January through July of 2022 was 1.3. I don't have it on the bar chart yet because we're not through the whole year yet, but so 1.3, you can imagine where that would sit. And then in August and September, the average concentrations were both below one. So lower again, still, I don't have the October results um, final just yet. There's sort of a delay in the laboratory results, but that's what we see. We see those benzene concentrations coming down first as a result of the, the termination of the refinery. And then even more notably as uh, decommissioning and demolition work 
proceeded. And again, these data are all available on our website. Here you'll go to community, reports, and then benzene monitoring. And every month, as we get two sort of rounds of these two week sampling results, we update those, those data to the, to the website. I think that's all the slides I have for tonight. I'll hand it back to you, Jess. Thanks. Thanks, JC. Um, you want to take some questions? We'll do some questions. Sure, happy to. Okay, um, Jeff Richer, I hope I said your last name right. Could you clarify what are the bulk of the responsibilities of each of the parties in their remediation efforts, if not only for Hillco? For example, HR, HRP is responsible for 23% of soil slash groundwater remediation in this section, 40% in this section. Oh, that's an interesting way. We don't think about it quite that way. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give the percentage. I, I No, I, not that I'm not sure. I won't be able to break it down in percentages, but this is how I would um, think about it. So for soil and groundwater remediation, um, so the, the vast majority of the refineries operation occurred prior to 2012. So there's been a refinery here since you know, for, for over a hundred years. So we have over a hundred years that, that occurred prior to 2012. And then, you know, since 2012, we have 10 years or so. Um, we also, of course, have much more specific environmental regulations and requirements after 2012 than we did, not before 2012, but certainly before, I don't know, 1960s, for example, right? So, we are able to sort of know more specifically what releases um, occurred after 2012, uh, both because there's requirements to look and also because Evergreen and Sunoco has a, has a very wide network of monitoring wells and other systems across the site that allows them to detect changes in subsurface conditions. So for example, if there was petroleum liquid in the subsurface and Sunoco knew about that. It's been there for a while. They're monitoring it. They're cleaning it up. And all of a sudden they start to see new petroleum in a place where they didn't see it before. That's an indicator of a new release. So it, I, I, can't, I can't break it down as a percentage, but what I can, the way I can sort of explain it to you if it spatially is that the entire former refinery, so that the whole area, this slide is not intended to show that, but it does work. The whole area that's shown in the orange boundary is an Act 2 site that Evergreen Sunoco is conducting sampling and cleanup work associated with it. So that whole area. And then, <coughs> excuse me, what we have is overlapped on top of that the five areas that I showed, we have specific releases and they, they do occur sort of on top of each other. We have five areas that PASRM or HRP is responsible for cleaning up because of when the release occurred. So it's five discrete areas compared to the, to the whole site. I, um, but it, the, the whole site is not equally contaminated. There are certain certainly focused areas that where the the contamination is more localized. I hope that answers the question or at least helps. Thanks, JC. Um, Ms. Carolyn, I see you wrote in the chat and um, requested live. So you let us know which one. If you want to go live, we're happy to hear your question. Ms. Carolyn, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry. It just took a long time for me to, to uh, connect live. Can you no hear me? No problem at all. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, I heard on two occasions so far this evening, um, and my name is Carolyn Mosby. I'm with the Eastwick community. And I heard on two occasions during this presentation how you will be moving soil from uh, areas that don't flood to build up the site uh, prior to you building so that the site won't be in the floodplain. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're taking very proactive measures 
to avoid flooding. But as you know, uh, uh, Philadelphia as a whole and certainly the lower Southwest and West Philadelphia communities are very flood prone areas. And that and water has to go somewhere. I, you know, I don't care what you do, it's got to go somewhere. And as a resident living in the lowest area of Philadelphia and uh, and the fact that we, this country, this world, we are in a climate crisis. How are you going to protect the surrounding communities? How are you gonna deal with the issues of sea level rise? Protecting the site is one thing, but human life is, is another thing. And I'd like to hear more about that. I would like to, uh, uh, or, or like for Hillco to work uh, closer with the community and or the EJAC, the Environmental Justice Advisory Commission, to address those concerns because they it is truly a valid concern. Thank you for taking my question. Sure, I, I can uh, address the or answer the question regarding kind of the resiliency, if you will. And, and there's not a direct answer other than obviously we submitted through um, the Army Corps of Engineers, City of Philadelphia, uh, the state, and it provided that floodplain study. Um, and, and part of that study is modeling certain uh, storm events and how they impact the surrounding area. Obviously, for us, it's along the Schuylkill River. Um, so those impacts you know, are adequately addressed, if you will. Um, I don't have any other you know, detailed information. I could turn it over to Jay, kind of, he's not the engineer who actually performed the, the, the Clomar, but he could probably shed some light on generally how that study, um, you know, works with our development. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> I can elaborate a little bit on that further. So to your point, yes, um, we did not directly prepare that study for this project, but in general, you know, they went through a study process where they analyzed the river um, flow data coming down through that river during certain storm events, um, you know, looking at the topography, doing a detailed survey of the site um, <clears throat> and comparing it to the existing FEMA information that was on hand. And I've been working through um, a lengthy process that's going in through a lot of details that focuses, you know, along the Schuylkill River, you know, um, you know, adjacent to the site uh, on both sides of the river, as well as upstream and downstream, and um, have taken into consideration those elevations and then have modeled the flooding events in accordance with the FEMA requirements to show what the impacts of those fill um, uh, movements of soil will have on the site and the surroundings. Well, thank you for your question, Ms. Carolyn. And uh, JC, if you're up for it, we have a few more uh, written questions in the Q&A. Um, this one is from, oh, Jeff, Jeff again. Uh, what sea level rise floodplain change projections are you using in the re remediation plans? JC, I feel like we you answered this one. I can speak to it quickly, yeah. Okay. So uh, the remedi so again, the remediation, I just, I want to always have to reiterate when I, when I talk about remediation plans on this site, that there are both our remediation plans and there's Evergreen's remediation plans, and I am only talking about ours. Um, but a lot of our planning is, is the same type of um, flood hazard planning that you heard Justin and Jake speak about, just being aware of what soils so that the impact on sort of contaminated soil and ground and groundwater which is my primary area of focus is if the surface water level rises that has the potential to impact the groundwater elevation as well and so you could have soil contamination that currently sort of is above the water table that in the future could be below the water table and, and things like that and that impacts um how the concentrations are distributed and also how the contamination has the potential to move in the subsurface. So that's that's how we would plan about it. Um, there isn't necessarily a specific elevation that we are 
focused on with respect to the remediation planning because groundwater elevations do fluctuate um, over time, just naturally seasonally, depending on precipitation and that sort of thing. So it that fluctuation of groundwater elevation is, is something that is part of our work, uh, sort of independent of, of sea level rise, but also just sort of acknowledging that those elevations could come shallower, if, if that helps. Thanks, JC. Why don't we move to the next slides, please? Lori, can you go to the next slide? Oh, I'm sorry, was I on mute? Nope. <laughs> You must have stepped away for a minute. Then. Hmm. Is it this slide? PDA process preview? Yes, thank you so much. I don't know if it's just me, but I'm still seeing the the Juliana's last slide. That's correct. I'm at two thousand and one sec. Okay, take your time. Thank you. Okay. While well, we look for Corey or Mia, you can share your screen. Juliana, we do have a few more questions. All right, let's go back to the chat, please. Well, it looks like Mia is quicker than I am. So Juliana, why don't we keep going? Sure. Why are you proposing to stop monitoring if benzene concentrations went up from August to September? Thanks for asking that one, Jazz. I saw it in the Q&A and it, it is a very important um, point to understand and I, um, I did not address it earlier, so thank you. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that benzene can come from other places too. Um, so it, it's present, well, it's present in gasoline at refineries, but it's also present in gasoline or diesel fuel in auto emissions. So in, in the cars that are driving up and down the interstate that's next to the site, for example, it can come from other industrial emissions, it can come from tobacco smoke, though in outdoor air, that's probably not as big an issue as an in indoor air. But so benzene is not only present in crude oil and is not only present at refineries. It can be present from other sources as well. And so what we see in urban areas is that there are benzene concentrations that are sort of just typical in urban areas. And I'm, I'm saying urban areas um, specifically because urban areas have more of those types of things that might cause there to be benzene in the outdoor air. More cars, cars that are closer together, that sort of thing compared to a rural area, for example, where there are fewer cars per the same area. And so just because of that, just because of those, all those activities, there is what we would refer to in sort of my field of background, there can be background benzene concentrations. So concentrations that would be present in the outdoor air, sort of absent any specific contaminant source or localized source like a refinery. And the background concentrations uh, that are typical in, in U.S. cities are around that high one, like around one, a little bit below one, what we're starting to see here in 2022. And when you're talking about something like background, the numbers will fluctuate a little bit because it might depend on how windy it is or how many of those emissions. They'll fluctuate, but they'll fluctuate within sort of a range. So that's what we're starting to see is that we see benzene concentrations that are really typical with what you would see in an urban setting. 
versus next to an active refinery. So you're right, it did, it did look like the average, it didn't look like it, it's true, the average was higher in September than it was in August, but those concentrations are all sort of consistent with what we see in, in urban settings. So it's no longer sort of indicative of a source that is localized on this property. I hope that helps. Thanks, Juliana. I'll um, dive into CBA process and then we can circle back with any remaining questions. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Mia Fioravanti and I am Vice President of Corporate Affairs for the Bellwether District. Um, as many of you know, in our September meeting, we committed to a Community Benefits Agreement or a CBA. Um, and this was following an expansion to our community engagement over the summer, where we announced among other things, um, a new community survey, um, and plans to conduct small in-person focus groups in addition to our um, quarterly uh, public meetings and community advisory panel meetings. Um, so tonight we're happy to share um, some initial details on our CBA process before we formally kick things off next year. Um, so for those of you who are new to the conversation and may be unfamiliar, a community benefits agreement or a CBA is a commitment made between a developer and community members um, that really solidifies the community's input in a project and how a developer uh, gives back. Um, our goal is to be um, transparent and to ensure that this project is one that we can all be proud of. And so we're hopeful that this process will only further that commitment. Um, so again, tonight we're going to walk you through some of our proposed process. Um, I think it's important to recognize that some of these details um, will be decided with our CBA negotiation groups when we begin the process next year. So it's possible we won't have all of the, the pieces of the puzzle this evening. Um, so Corey, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, okay, so first we wanted to share what our goals are for the CBA and, and kind of the purpose of a CBA more broadly. Um, as I said, our goal is to really understand and then formalize how we will give back, taking community members' input into account. Um, I think it, it's really important for everyone to understand that this agreement should not only serve the people who are around the table in negotiations, but also the broader community, and that's a, a huge priority for us. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Corey. So I want to start with who, you know, who will participate in these discussions. Um, as we shared at our last meeting, we will be utilizing our community advisory panel or CAP to negotiate the CBA. Um, our community advisory panel is a group of 25 registered community organizations and other key stakeholders that represent the South and Southwest communities. Um, we meet with this group bi-monthly and they, they truly serve as our eyes and ears in the community. Um, so as part of this process, each group will be asked to choose two individuals um, from their organizations to participate. Um, and we're asking that um, at least one representative attends each meeting. Um, additionally, we have a few institutions that currently serve on our CAP. So for example, Penn um, and, Trex and Drexel and um, you know, some uh, groups within the city, and those, those groups will be participating, but in a non-voting capacity. Um, as we also shared in our last meeting, we're extending an invitation to the United South Southwest Coalition um, to become a member of our community advisory panel and therefore participate in the CBA process. Um, and Corey, if you don't mind going to the, the next slide. Um, I just want to give you a sense. So here are our current community, community advisory panel groups. I'll pause here. And then Corey, if you don't mind flipping to the next slide, um, here is that list including the coalition. So it's important to note here that we already have eight groups on our community advisory panel that are coalition members, um, and that's in addition to that new coalition seat. Um, and so Corey, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, you know, to start, as I, I shared earlier, some of the details around our process will be decided on jointly with the CBA negotiation groups. Um, and we expect those details may include um, rules, things like rules of engagement or voting structure or um, you know, creating a system for how we will track these commitments outlined in the CBA. Um, but just generally, here are some kind of key, key details that we want to share with you tonight. So one, 
Um, we hope to have a signed CBA by early 2024 or within one calendar year. Um, however, it is possible that that process will take longer and we, we did wanna share that. Um, we will be using a third party facilitator to lead the CBA discussions. Um, and one of our first items in the process will be to interview and select that third party facilitator in partnership with our CBA groups. Um, we expect that CBA discussions will occur monthly and will include a mix of both in-person and virtual meetings. Um, and we plan to discuss kind of targeted topics each month. So for example, workforce development initiatives, maybe one month, green space initiatives, et cetera. Um, and last, we will ensure that we're incorporating conversations as part of that process that include HRP and that don't include HRP um, as determined by the CBA group. Or if you don't mind just going to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so last and importantly, um, we want to ensure that this process incorporates input from outside of these CBA group discussions. Um, we're committed to continuing to share and gather feedback in the form of our quarterly public meetings, um, individual meetings with registered community organizations and nonprofits and community groups, um, continuing surveying, um, and those small focus groups I mentioned earlier. And, and Sarah um, Bond, who I, I saw your, your, top, your question in the chat, excuse me, while we're on this topic, I just wanted to answer that about um, our timeline for those small focus groups. Um, so as some of you may remember, we announced plans for this over the summer um, and we were delayed in launching those in-person focus groups. So just to provide an update, we've identified the group of people who are going to um, facilitate or lead those focus groups. All of those individuals are based in South and Southwest Philadelphia. We're currently in the process of providing um, an orientation for those focus group leaders. Um, so for example, for providing a deep dive on some of the issues we discussed tonight, um, providing a tour of the site, et cetera. And so as soon as that process is complete, um, we'll be announcing that opportunity, opportunity to the general public, I anticipate sometime in the next few weeks. Um, and so, you know, through all of these things and all of these processes, processes, we want to ensure that this feedback is is kind of formally documented and presented to the CBA groups for consideration throughout the process. So, uh, you know, not only are we going to continue doing these these various forms of outreach, but we really want to make sure that it is, um, you know, heavily weighted as, as part of the CBA process. Um, and so uh, that's what we're planning. That was what we were um, looking to share with you this evening. And we look forward to uh, providing periodic updates to you over the course of the next year. Um, and so I think we can go to the last slide and share our contact information. And then um, I know we are a little over time, but Jasmine, I don't know if we wanna take additional questions from the chat or answer in writing. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, of course. Um, let's see, we have a question. What type of agreements impacts is HRP excited to facilitate helped fund as part of a CBA. I can take that in here. So we- Sorry, I was turning back on my- Okay, you want it? Go for it. I was just gonna ask you to repeat the question. <laughs> what types of agreements impacts, agreements or impacts, I think that's what he means, is HRP excited to facilitate? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, so I, th I think I'll just turn, I'll just, the answer is, it, it, you know, we don't, we we're not going to know the answer to that until we really get into, into those discussions with our CBA groups. But, and like, just to share um, some initial findings relating to our survey from over the summer, we were really um, pleased to be kind of aligned with the feedback that people were giving us as part of that survey. So I think some of the topics we might consider, again, would be workforce development initiatives. We are going to create a significant amount of jobs um, through this project, and we want to ensure that those jobs go to local Philadelphians. I think that's a, um, a huge area um, of opportunity and something we can think about as part of the CBA. Um, you know, certainly investments in, in green spaces, um, you know, investments in local schools and scholarship programs. So I think, you know, a lot of those topics that were kind of bubbled up in the survey are also of great importance to us. So we, I think just, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but we're excited that um, we're, we're kind of in alignment there and look forward to those conversations and see a lot of opportunity. Thank you, Mia. Well, we are right at time. We want to thank everyone for joining us for this um, community meeting and please stay tuned for more updates and uh, you have me and Mia's information.
please follow us on all socials. And we really appreciate you coming out tonight. And I just thank you.